Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm going to tell you the story of how observations of exploding stars called supernovae revealed to us that we live in a universe that is not just expanding, we knew that already, uh, but is actually accelerating, uh, that is expanding faster and faster, propelled by a mysterious new component of the universe that we call dark energy, but about which we know very little. Uh, before I can get to the exciting new stuff, let me just take you back a little bit and tell you how we viewed the universe before this discovery. Um, this is a deep image of the universe. This is not just any deep image. This is actually the deepest image ever taken of the universe. Uh, we picked a blank spot in the sky, and we used the Hubble Space Telescope and its advanced camera just to stare with the shutter open for the equivalent of a number of weeks. Uh, and so what you get to do is collect the light of very distant objects. There's tens of thousands of galaxies in this image, uh, some of which, the faintest of which, are about a trillion times fainter than anything you could see with your eye. Um, and this is just a tiny patch of the sky. Uh, this is a patch so small, if you took a single grain of sand and held it out at arm's length, you could cover a patch like this. So obviously the universe is just chock full with billions of galaxies. Um, so when you look at a picture like this, uh, it looks like the universe is static. You don't see anything moving. Uh, I said we kept the shutter open for a long time, uh, but nothing is blurry. Uh, so we don't get a ready impression of the universe as in motion, but it really is. The universe acts as though it received a big kick we call the Big Bang, and now the separation between galaxies grows. Uh, you could think of this like a giant loaf of raisin bread in the oven, that uh, it's uh, rising in the oven and uh, galaxies are like the raisins. Whichever raisin you're sitting on, you look at all the other raisins around you and they are all moving away. It doesn't matter where you sit, everything appears to be moving away. You also notice, uh, especially in the animation, that uh, the further away, a raisin or a galaxy is from us, the faster it appears to recede from us because there's more dough, there's more space between us and the other objects. Um, so how do we really know this about our universe, that it's expanding? And the answer, of course, is we checked. Um, and, uh, but you wonder, you know, how would you check this? And uh, looking back at that animation, you would actually want to witness the motions and the positions of galaxies around us. So in order to do that, uh, we have to tackle the first major problem in cosmology, which is to figure out how far away things are. Uh, before we can think about figuring out how far away things are in space, it's useful to talk about how do we figure out how far away things are, let's say, here on the Earth. Um, so on the Earth, we have lots of different tricks. Uh, the first I'll mention is called parallax, uh, that uh, you make a virtual triangle in space. You see surveyors do this all the time. They plant their equipment, uh, they sight some distant tree that they want to measure the distance to, and they complete the triangle by then moving their equipment to another location, uh, and they measure the angle through which that tree appears to move when they move from one location to the other. As you remember from geometry, you have a triangle, you have a length, you have an angle, now you've solved the whole triangle. You can figure out how far away that tree is. Uh, this doesn't work so well in space. I'll say more about this later. Space is very huge, uh, and so it is difficult for us to set up triangles in this way. Uh, another method is the method of lighthouses. So ship captain at night uh, wants to make sure that they have sufficient distance from the rocky shore, and so they look out at a lighthouse, and they understand that a lighthouse is intrinsically very luminous. So the faintness of the lighthouse is what reassures them that they are still far away from the rocky shore. Now, you could be fooled if it were, let's say, a foggy night, uh, that uh, a lighthouse, even if it was up uh, very close to you, would still look faint, fooling you into thinking that you're still far from the rocky shore. But we have other tools fog horns. This is the same principle that you have something intrinsically very powerful that is diluted or attenuated by having to cover a larger and larger volume as it moves out. So when the fog horn sounds quiet, again, you know that you're very far away. Uh, and finally, there are what we call objects of known size. So all around us, we see far away things that uh, we recognize what their intrinsic size is. We've been up close to them before. Uh, you look at this uh, squadron of airplanes and you immediately recognize these are the same kinds of airplanes, just the ones that appear small 
are very distant airplanes. My four-year-old son uh, might not know this. He might think that those are baby airplanes and that they're up close with their families. But uh, uh, we recognize that uh, these are actually different, uh, the same kind of object in different locations. So these are all great, but these are all human-made objects. So we don't have access to anything exactly like this an experiment that we can set up precisely in space. So we have to use telescopes and whatever nature provides. And it turns out nature provides an object which is very similar to that lighthouse, something that cosmologists call a standard candle because we understand its luminosity so well, we can treat it just like this lighthouse. So uh, a galaxy like the one you see there will typically contain some 100 billion stars and uh, about once every 100 years, a single star may explode in that galaxy. And this is known as a supernova. Here goes one right now. And uh, when we see one of these supernovae, they act like these lighthouses. They're extremely luminous. They're as bright as uh, billions of times the luminosity of our sun. And from the brightness of the supernova, we can gauge how far away it is. We can do this in a very quantitative way because we know that uh, light and distance will obey the inverse square law, that uh, if the object is twice as far away, it'll be four times as faint. Three times as far away, it'll be nine times as faint. You could imagine this as though the light has to paint the surface of a larger and larger sphere centered on us, which is why the light declines as one over the distance squared. So that's great. We look for these supernovae, and we can measure distances. Uh, the other thing from that animation we needed to be able to measure is the apparent motion of the galaxies away from us. And we do this in a different way. Light is emitted by objects in the universe, like a supernova, at generally known wavelengths, wavelengths of light that we can determine in the laboratory where nothing is moving. And then we notice that the pattern of wavelengths of light is shifted. It's shifted in a particular way by the expansion of the universe. Here's an animation of that. So the light is emitted at the known wavelength, but as the light propagates to us, space stretches, and we receive a redshifted or longer wavelength version of that light. We can measure this effect, and uh, this might remind you of the Doppler shift that you've heard of, but I just want to be clear, the interpretation is different, and this is critical. It's not that the distant object is really moving away from us, it's that space itself is actually expanding. And as I said, that's a key distinction. Uh, if it were just an object moving away, you would have no reason to believe that any other object nearby would have any predictable motion, any predictable blue shift or red shift. If it's space that's expanding, then it creates this entire pattern. I'll give you what I think is a useful analogy. If you've ever been to an airport and uh, you see a bunch of people standing together moving along at some constant speed, you can't see them below the knees, uh, you might think they've all decided to walk together at exactly the same speed, some conspiracy or conversation, collusion involved. But you also might recognize there are these things called people movers, these conveyor belts that bring people along. And that is a deeper understanding. You would understand the actual phenomenon, and you would be able to explain the whole pattern. You'd have expectations as well. So in our case, we understand that this is actually due to the expansion of space. Um, so when we see one of these standard candles, we can measure immediately how far away it is and how fast it appears to be moving or how much space has stretched over that interval. So now we can go back to the animation that I showed you before, you see on the left, except we can become quantitative about this. We can pick out individual galaxies that have these supernovae in them, and we can measure their distance, and we can measure their apparent motion away from us, and this linear relationship between the two is the signature of an expanding universe. It's famously called Hubble's Law, and we can use a measurement like this to tell us how fast the universe is expanding. So if the universe were expanding faster, it would be a steeper line. If the universe were expanding more slowly, it would be a shallow line. If the universe were contracting instead of expanding, it would actually be a negative slope. We would actually have blue shifts individually. Um, now, this is not just a thought experiment. This was first witnessed by the famous American astronomer Edwin Hubble, for whom we named the telescope for. Um, he had combined measurements of redshifts of galaxies around us uh, by the astronomer Vesto Slipher with his own measurements of the distances to those galaxies. And he made this very iconic, I think this is one of the most important 
simple plots uh, that's been made in the 20th century. Uh, I say I don't have a tattoo, but if I got a tattoo, I would probably get it of this. That's, that's how meaningful it is to me. Um, but you can see, you can just tell this linear relationship between these that indicates that the universe is expanding. Now, if that didn't convince you, uh, in my thesis work uh, in 1996, I used the supernovae to extend these measurements out further. So Hubble's original diagram would fit in this tiny little red square in the lower left-hand corner there of the diagram. And then we continued to make measurements farther and farther out. So now there really is no doubt you could see a very clean linear relationship, hence the universe is expanding. Um, so this is exciting. You've already learned one thing, that the universe is expanding and how it is that we measure that. And we can immediately address a deep, philosophical, profound question, when did the universe begin? This is something that I got into this field to study because I thought this is the kind of question that you can only ask you know, your rabbi or your philosopher or something like that. I'm amazed to find that this is a quantitative science and we can actually address this in a, uh, in a very physics-based uh, system. So Hubble's law of the expansion of the universe tells us uh, how fast the universe is expanding. This is great because we can treat this like a movie that we are watching uh, forward. We can imagine rewinding the movie. Uh, and so instead of the universe expanding at this rate we've carefully measured, we can imagine the universe contracting at that rate. We keep running this movie backwards, that is, using Hubble's constant, the present expansion rate of the universe, to run the movie back until everything goes further and further closer together until everything is on top of everything else. And that is a measure of the age of the universe. It's like uh, when you turn on the marathon, the New York City Marathon, and the runners are at mile 20, and you measure the speed at which they're running, you can guesstimate how long ago the marathon race started. That is assuming that they haven't been speeding up or slowing down the whole time. It's what we call a good first order guess. And so the inverse of the Hubble constant gives you that first order guess. Now, interestingly, when Hubble himself measured this number, uh, he was way off, and he got a silly answer for the age of the universe. The answer he got was that the universe is about two billion years old. Um, now, even in 1929, when he did this work, we knew that the universe, we knew that the Earth was older than that, I should say, uh, from dating uh, rocks uh, and different isotopes, we knew the universe, uh, the Earth, excuse me, was at least a few billion years old. But things changed over the next 80 years. We learned to measure the expansion of the universe better. This is actually one of the hardest measurements to make, uh, and it requires us to understand a great deal about the astrophysics of the objects in the universe that we are using as tools. So this was a nice uh, article in the New York Times a few years ago in the Science Times on our quest to measure the Hubble constant back from Hubble's initial measurements to where we are today. And uh, I show here the inverse of the Hubble constant, giving you approximately the age of the universe. So we learned some very important lessons along the way. We learned that there has been more than one generation of stars. Uh, stars go through their whole life cycle. They may explode. Uh, they may just uh, burn out. But either way, another generation comes along with heavy elements produced by the first generation, and those stars have different luminosities than the first generation. So it would be like confusing one lighthouse model for another. And so we had to learn that. That gave us a great correction. Um, the, this became a much more quantitative science when we replaced photographic plates in telescopes with uh, the same charge couple devices that are in your smartphones that you use to take digital photography. Um, we launched the Hubble Space Telescope, which was really designed to uh, help us make this measurement much more precisely than before. We learned how to measure distances to supernovae. And if you look just in the last decade or so, there's been a tremendous tightening in these measurements. Uh, my colleagues and I made the most precise measurement of the Hubble constant, the local expansion rate, just a few years ago. Uh, we get a number of 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec. The inverse of that is about 13.5 billion years. So that is what we get as determined locally as the age of the universe. And later on in the talk, I'll get to how I think we can improve this measurement even more. But let me jump ahead to the next topic. Uh, you might wonder, OK, the universe is expanding, but uh, what happens next? Right? 
Um, well, like anything in motion, you wonder what happens next. Uh, this reminds me very much of when Isaac Newton thought about launching a cannonball from the surface of the Earth, and he wondered what would be the fate of this cannonball. He recognized he could give it greater and greater velocity, and it will make it further out. If he gave it enough velocity, it would have a, a special value of velocity we call the escape velocity, enough velocity to overcome the gravitational pull from the Earth and uh, eke its way out to infinity, even greater velocity it would go way beyond that. Um, of course, it matters what the mass is of the planet you're launching it from as well. So the uh, value of the escape velocity actually depends on the mass of the planet you launch it from. If you're trying to launch the cannonball from the moon, which has much less mass, this is much easier to do. Um, so our expectation was that the universe itself was a little like this cannonball in motion, that uh, sure, there was this initial kick from the Big Bang and everything was moving, but now the attractive gravity from all the stuff in the universe was pulling back on it. And the really profound and exciting question to ask was, does the universe have escape velocity from itself? That is, if you take the combination of the velocity, we measure this uh, expansion, and the mass or mass density of the universe, how do those equate? Will the universe expand forever like the cannonball escaping, or will it fall back and start collapsing in the future like the cannonball that doesn't make it out? Now, Einstein had a completely different idea, and he was at a, a big disadvantage in thinking about this. In uh, just 100 years ago, for, uh, more or less this year, uh, Einstein had developed a new theory of gravity called general relativity, which imagined gravity in a very different way. And he decided one of the first things to do with this is to throw it at the whole universe to see what general relativity had to say about the dynamics of the universe. Now, at the time, astronomers were telling him that the universe was static, that neither, it was neither expanding or contracting. And the astronomers at the time were themselves confused because what they called the universe was really just the Milky Way galaxy. So they were unaware of the general expansion of space. So they gave, they gave Einstein some bum information and he tried to work with it. And so he recognized if the universe was static and then whoever set it up that way let it go, uh, then this attractive gravity would tend to make things fall together again. So there must be some way to counteract this attractive gravity, and he made an amazing discovery. Uh, he discovered essentially that while the gravity of matter in the universe is attractive, the gravity of empty space itself could be repulsive, uh, something he called the cosmological constant. Today, we would more generally call dark energy. And he thought the that this repulsive gravity of empty space and the attractive gravity of stuff were in perfect balance. That's what was going on. Um, now, I don't know if Einstein thought very deeply about this. He might have recognized that even if this were true, this would be what we call an unstable equilibrium. That means that I can balance a marble on top of a basketball if I'm exceedingly careful uh, and I get it just at the top. But if I am off by any little amount, Rather than restoring itself to the top, the marble will run away. It's an unstable equilibrium. The same thing would be true of the universe set up the way Einstein imagined it. If the universe got a little more dense, then attractive gravity actually wins, starts to get stronger, because it depends on the separation of objects. Um, but more importantly, uh, Einstein learned later, uh, about 10 years later, that the universe was not static, that the universe was actually expanding. There's a famous trip he took in 1931 to Mount Wilson Observatory where he visited uh, Edwin Hubble and uh, his colleagues there. Uh, he even uh, took a look through the telescope just to make sure Hubble was, was getting this right. Um, I, this is funny, this must be a PR shot because uh, you know, at the time, uh, Hubble was using photographic plates to add up light for an hour. You couldn't actually see any of the things that Hubble was actually seeing. So I don't know what Einstein, he just must be seeing darkness. Um, but, you know, he's a theorist, so he probably didn't know he sh shouldn't say anything and look stupid. Um, but uh, anyway, so famously, uh, he retracts this idea, and uh, uh, it uh, sort of falls back into the, uh, the wastebasket of physics. Okay, so then can we actually measure if the universe is slowing down in its expansion, like that cannonball? And when you measure the deceleration of the cannonball to the Earth, you are, in essence, weighing the Earth. And taking that information and the current velocity of the cannonball, you can make a prediction. Will it, will it 
escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. So we can do the same thing. If we can measure the deceleration of the expansion, we will, in essence, determine what the mass is of the universe. That, combined with our measurement of the current expansion rate, will tell us if we're on a trajectory to recollapse uh, or if we have escape velocity. So how do we do this? How do we measure the deceleration of the expansion of the universe? Well, uh, if the universe were like the economy, right, you could just wait until the next quarter and check new performance versus past performance. But uh, these things change very slowly, and so this would not be a useful way to go. So instead, we use what I think of as kind of a trick, which is uh, the realization that the universe does not instant message. When we look out and measure the expansion rate of the universe, as I told you in the first part of this talk, I was sort of a little dishonest there. Uh, we cannot actually measure how fast the universe is expanding right now. The information we get from these distant supernovae has a built-in delay, often millions or billions of years. So we are learning about the past expansion rate of the universe. Now we can turn this around to our advantage and reach much further back. So if we, let's say, find a distant standard candle, we might be measuring how fast the universe was expanding a billion years ago. If we find a more distant one, this might be telling us about two billion years ago. More distant, maybe three billion years ago. This is a powerful way to actually observe the past changes in the expansion rate of the universe. So we can't, and rather than measuring in the future whether the universe is decelerating, we just measure in the past how it was decelerating. Um, now, in the mid-1990s, when I got involved in this work, the expectation was that the universe either resembled the model on the left or the model on the right. The model on the left would be the heavyweight universe. This would be the cannonball launched from the surface of an extremely heavy planet, which therefore would not have escape velocity. It would expand and at some point would start to contract and end in kind of a big crunch, sort of the opposite of the Big Bang. Um, Alternatively, uh, we could have been in a very lightweight universe, very little matter, like launching that cannonball off the surface of the moon, very easy to do. And so with the velocity that we currently have, uh, the universe would expand forever. And another possibility was that we lived on the knife edge just between these two, just at, at exactly escape velocity for the mass uh, of our Earth. And so, as I said, we had measured already how fast the universe is expanding. We wanted to weigh the universe by measuring the past deceleration of the universe. Now, it turns out not any kind of supernova will provide this standard candle for us. There's a special class of supernovae called type 1A supernovae. Um, this was first really explained by the famous Indian astrophysicist Chandrasekhar in the 1930s uh, that a star, actually the core of a star like our sun, called a white dwarf star in a particular configuration, um, can only hold back the crush of gravity uh, up to a certain critical mass known as the Chandrasekhar mass. Um, so that's all well and good that white dwarf star can be happily holding up uh, the crushing uh, force of gravity by a special kind of, it's called electron degeneracy pressure. Um, but if another star, let's say a companion star, starts spilling material over onto that star, little by little, the, the original star, the white dwarf, can grow in mass until it crosses Chandrasekhar's limit, and then you will get a runaway thermonuclear explosion. You have the inability to hold back gravity, so the star crushes and fusion occurs throughout the star immediately. This is a great formula for a standard bomb, right? You have uh, in this case, 1.4 times the mass of the sun, runaway thermonuclear explosion leads to a very uniform uh, luminosity, about 4 billion times the luminosity of the sun at peak. Uh, what's also so great about these objects is we can see them very far away. Uh, you want a standard candle that's very luminous, so we can see these halfway across the visible universe, maybe three quarters of the way uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. So. Uh, in, the, in my graduate work, I started looking for and measuring the supernovae. Uh, here are four of the ones that I studied in my thesis from 1995. Uh, you might wonder, how do we find these supernovae? And well, you can see it's quite easy. You just look for the arrows in the pictures, and there's usually a dot at the end of the arrow. No, we add the, uh, we add the arrows in Photoshop later. No, but how do, we, how do you really find a supernova. Well, it's a needle in a haystack problem, or it's uh, you know trying to win the lottery. It's incredibly rare, 
So there'll only be one, as I said, in a galaxy like ours about every 100 years. Um, so the way you win the lottery is you buy all the lottery tickets, right? So uh, in our case, what that means is we recognize that we can turn the odds in our favor if we uh, have enough lottery tickets. So if there's one in a galaxy like ours every 100 years, that means there is one supernova in 100 galaxies in a year. So you monitor 100 galaxies, you'll probably find a supernova in a year. But we want many more than that, so then you start monitoring thousands or tens of thousands of galaxies at the same time. You saw that picture I showed you in the beginning. We can easily take images that have tens or hundreds of thousands of galaxies all in them, and then you use computers. Computers are very good at doing this very monotonous process of taking two sets of images separated by some period of time, typically a month or a week, and digitally matching them and subtracting them and alerting a human observer uh, that there's a new point of light that has appeared between the two exposures. And this often turns out to be a type 1a supernova. I could say more about that later if people are interested. OK, so in the mid-1990s, my colleagues and I <clears throat> had been good at measuring nearby supernovae to measure how fast the universe was expanding. So we began using large telescopes to measure uh, the very distant supernovae that would tell us about the past expansion rate that we could compare to today. And uh, so we formed a team. And just to show you how strongly convinced we were, we were measuring the deceleration of the universe. You have to come up with a, a credo or a tagline. And so ours was to measure the cosmic deceleration of the universe with type 1a supernovae. Um, except we got a great surprise when we did this. And uh, I was uh, the sort of tip of the spear for seeing this surprise. Um, by about 1997, uh, we had collected our first significant set of the supernovae, and it was time to see what the answer was. And uh, so as I, just to remind you again, I was using the supernovae to measure the deceleration of the universe that would equate to some amount of mass in the universe that would tell us whether we, were, we had escape velocity. Um, and so I was using a very simple equation that the deceleration would equate to the mass of the universe, and I wrote a little computer program to tell me, OK, fit the data and tell me uh, what the mass is of the universe. I wanted to jump right to the answer. Don't even tell me the deceleration. Just let's go right to the right-hand side of that equation. And uh, this is the key page from my lab notebook. Um, so the mass should have been either a small number, like 0.3, or a big number, like 1. Um, and instead, it was a negative number. Now, this made no sense. There's no such thing as negative mass. But computers don't know physics. Uh, they just know, you know what you tell them and, and what they can fit. So when I gave such a simple equation and forced the computer to find a match to the data, uh, it wasn't able to say, hey, dummy, you should notice that uh, the universe is not decelerating, that I actually I need to change the sign on the left here. But you're not letting me do that. You're only letting me play with math. So I'm going to change that sign. Um, so I realized pretty quickly that that is not physical, that you need something else, something like Einstein's cosmological constant. So I've added here now another term that, as you see, can act the opposite way. You could explain the universe accelerating only if you have something very much like Einstein's cosmological constant, not just have it, but actually has to be dominant. It has to be more important. Uh, more uh, larger in size than the mass in the universe. Uh, we equate mass and energy frequently in physics, so uh, you understand that I'm saying that the, uh, the energy of this has to be greater than the energy of that. Um, so a few days later, I started thinking about the cosmological constant. Could this be what was going on? And uh, here's another page from my lab notebook where I was calculating the likelihood that this really was in the data, and it was quite high. It was high enough that uh, I had to admit that uh, it was time to talk to other people about this, that this was probably not just what we would say a fluke or bad luck. Um, I did a lot of cross-checking to make sure I hadn't made a simple mistake. And then I contacted uh, my colleagues. I was collaborating with about 17 astronomers spread all over the planet. Uh, we spread all over the planet because, well, it's always nighttime somewhere on the planet. And we're observing these supernovae all the time, so it's very useful to have colleagues in South America, Hawaii, Europe, Australia. Um, and so over the course of about 24 hours, we began a discussion of, do we really believe these results? And uh, I'm going to show you some emails back and forth from that discussion, because it's very interesting to see how scientists react to something unexpected. Uh, scientists tend to be very conservative, because most new things turn out to be wrong. Um, so. Uh, 
my colleague uh, in uh, Berkeley, California, Alex Filipenko, wrote to the team, uh, Adam showed me fantastic plots before he left for his wedding. Our data imply a non-zero cosmological constant. Who knows? This might be the right answer. Uh, Bruno Leibengut from Germany, who is a supernova expert, responded, concerning a cosmological constant, I'd like to ask Adam or anybody else in the group if they feel prepared enough to defend the answer. There is no point in writing an article if we are not very sure we are getting the right answer. Um, Brian Schmidt, uh, my colleague who had helped find the supernovae, wrote from Australia, I agree our data imply a cosmological constant, but how confident are we in this result? I find it very perplexing. Uh, my thesis advisor, Bob Kirshner uh, at Harvard, but on sabbatical in Santa Barbara, wrote, uh, I am worried. In your heart, you know the cosmological constant is wrong. Though your head tells you that you don't care and you're just reporting the observations, it would be silly to say we must have a non-zero cosmological constant only to retract it next year. Uh, John, uh, Mark Phillips in Chile, uh, my colleague there, as serious and responsible scientist, ha, we all know that it is far too early to be reaching firm conclusions about the value of the cosmological constant. Um, John Tonry in Hawaii, uh, who remembers the detection of the magnetic monopole and other gaffes? On the other hand, we should not be shy about getting our results out. He's referring to there, of course, there are may, many famous misdiscoveries in physics, and you know uh, we didn't want to be the next uh, people to discover cold fusion or magnetic monopoles or, or any one of these things. Um, but it's funny in physics, uh, you're sort of sometimes you're just you have to play the hand that you're dealt, and this is this is the hand that we had. Um, Alex Filipenko, uh, if we are wrong in the end, then so be it. At least we ran in the race. Uh, there was another team located, uh, I was at the time working at UC Berkeley down on campus, and there was a competing team at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which was a Department of Energy lab, doing the same experiment. So there was a feeling of competition and uh, uh, an interest in working well but quickly. Um, so then uh, uh, I responded, uh, the results are very surprising, shocking even. I've avoided telling anyone about them because I wanted to do some cross-checks. I have. And I wanted to get further into writing the results up. The data require a non-zero cosmological constant. Approach these results not with your heart or head, but with your eyes. We are observers, after all. Um, Alejandro Clociati from Chile wrote, if Einstein made a mistake with the cosmological constant, why couldn't we? Um, I, I never quite understood if that was supposed to be reassuring or not. Uh, but you know, I guess if the, if the grand old man had made this mistake, well, we'd be safe, too. Um, Nick Sunset from Chile, uh, I really encourage you, Adam, to work your butt off on this. We need to be careful. If you are really sure that the cosmological constant is not zero, my God, get it out. I mean this seriously. You probably never will have another scientific result that is more exciting come your way in your lifetime. Of course, Nick was right. Um, so in 1998, we published this paper, Observational Evidence from Supernovae for an Accelerating Universe and a Cosmological Constant. In other words, it looked like the universe was about 70 percent, you'll keep hearing this number, 70 percent in the form of dark energy, something like Einstein's cosmological constant. And the other competing team came to the same conclusion about the same time. So this, was, this rapidly became uh, part of the, the story. The, in fact, it became the breakthrough of the year for Science Magazine in 1998. Apparently, Einstein himself would have been pretty amazed that this, this feature, what some people might have thought was a bug, but really a feature in general relativity, was actually being exercised or actually being witnessed in the universe. So why do we actually think the universe is accelerating now? Well, in detail, we really don't know. That is, we have a kind of general story, hand wavy, word salad, but uh, we don't really understand the physics or the nature of this dark energy. So. Uh, sometimes we refer to it as the vacuum energy. So uh, there's an idea that comes to us, well, uh, a feature of quantum mechanics, quantum theory, the uh, physics of very small objects, that the vacuum is a very rich place where particles appear and disappear, that we cannot uh, have total certainty that it's empty. As a result of that, we actually have certainty that it, that it is a very active place with lots of energy of this type. But when we try to calculate uh, all the energy states that are possible, we get an answer that's about 120 orders of magnitude off from what would allow our universe to exist. So, as I said, that's an idea, and it sounds, it smells like what we're seeing, but there's a giant disconnect between calculation uh, and actual observation. Maybe we could ask Brian more about that at the end. Um, 
nevertheless, this is still a very powerful idea. We have seen other, I would say, dark energy uh, in the universe. If you've heard about the Higgs field and the Higgs boson, this is a built-in energy and a built-in particle in space that would act like dark energy. It's not the dark energy or all our dark energy, but it is a place where we've been able to touch and see that uh, empty space has actual activity in it, has actual important physics that we just don't understand that well. It could be we have a dynamical dark energy. So this would be like a, a time variable or changing form of this. It would be a vacuum energy that changes from place to place and time to time. It's associated with a field. You could think of the electric field or the magnetic field. It has a value in all places, but it will change with time. This sounds like a weird idea, but we actually believe that uh, something like this, an uh, episode we call inflation, occurred shortly after the Big Bang when the Earth was actually dominated by a temporary vacuum energy that caused the universe to accelerate greatly, tremendously, exponentially, uh, much greater than what we see now. That period ended. Um, perhaps we are entering a new sort of a gentler version of that. Or it still could be that we don't understand uh, gravity, that we still have the wrong theory of physics and dark energy and dark matter and these extra parts are just the, uh, you know, the ether and the epicycles and the, you know, the extra stuff when you don't have the right theory of physics. But I, I would say these in order are probably our best guesses. Now, back in 2000, this was such a crazy set of possibilities, we worried about something just much more basic. What if we were just wrong? What if uh, when we saw a distant supernova and thought that distant meant faint, like the light uh, ship captain that a faint lighthouse meant far away, what if we were being fooled by something, uh, in which case the universe wouldn't be accelerating uh, at all? How could we be fooled? Well, there could be a kind of, I, I talked about fog, a kind of cosmic fog, what we would call uh, dust, gray dust. Uh, if it lived in between galaxies, it would make distant objects look faint. Now, nobody had ever seen uh, this gray fog before, but then nobody had ever seen uh, dark energy before. So you couldn't use uh, Occam's razor and say one is crazier than the other. We actually had to go out and prove it. Uh, another possibility could have been that uh, there was an evolution, that we were looking at supernovae that were born when the universe was uh, much younger and actually had less chemical enrichment. Maybe those supernovae were born fainter. So the idea here is when we looked out at something faint, that meant that it was far away, and hence there was dark energy. But what if instead faint meant dusty, not so far away, and there was no dark energy? So um, we realized that if we could look out even further to more distant supernovae, uh, this story where we're looking through some, uh, some kind of fog would just continue to add up. We would keep seeing things look ever fainter. Uh, or if there was this evolution, younger supernovae in the age in the universe were fainter, that would continue as well. Whereas, if we really had this new cosmological model where there's dark matter and there's dark energy, the universe would have decelerated in the beginning uh, and it only would have accelerated more recently. And we should be able to witness this change that would break the degeneracy, I would say, with these other stories. Now, in order to do that, we needed to use a more powerful telescope, more powerful than what we had mostly used before. Here's a short history of the improving power of telescopes. Um, this is compared to, let's say, here's Galileo's telescope. Got about a, almost a factor of 100 improvement in sensitivity over your eye. And then telescopes got bigger. Uh, we moved them to better sites. Uh, we uh, changed the detectors from our eyes, which are not very efficient detectors, can't integrate light for very long, to photographic plates, and then to electronic detectors. And then, sometimes we're really lucky, when uh, astronauts go and put a telescope up into space, the Hubble Space Telescope, it sits above the blurring effects of the atmosphere. If you've ever sat in the bottom of a pool and looked up at your friend outside the pool, everything looks all swimmy and wavy. Well, that's what happens to the lights that we see from stars. So when we put that telescope above the atmosphere, we can get very sharp images. So here is the image of a supernova and its host galaxy as seen from the ground, same one as seen with the Hubble Space Telescope. And if your goal is to be able to uh, measure the brightness of the supernova without the light from the host galaxy, you can see that's an easier job here on the right. And then we've been particularly lucky, the astronauts sometimes return to the telescope and put state-of-the-art technology, um, newer detectors, 
in there, and that improves our ability to observe the very distant objects. Um, so in early 2000, uh, 2002, the astronauts put the advanced camera in, and we used it to find about 25 of these Type 1a supernovae, all from this earlier era of the universe, when it was still decelerating, when it was still compact before uh, it gave way to uh, dark energy. And uh, we were able to rule out those uh, alternative stories as well as the original cosmological models to uh, get a convincing case that we live in a universe that has both dark matter and dark energy that was decelerating in the beginning when everything was very compact. But as it got larger, at some point there was a transition, we believe about five or six billion uh, years ago, and the universe is now uh, expanding about 20% faster due to this dark energy. Um, now, it's not just dark energy, uh, sorry, it is not just uh, acceleration as witnessed by supernovae that convince us that the universe is filled with dark energy. We, uh, uh, as you saw in the email, scientists are very conservative and we like a lot of redundancy and cross-checking. And so now there's about five or six independent lines of investigation which give us this same picture. Supernovae were the first in 1998 um, in 2003, we saw evidence of what's called the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. So that means that there are photons of light from the cosmic microwave background, which are on their way to us, but along the way, they run into these kind of potholes that are the gravitational potentials of clusters of galaxies. And they kind of fall into this pothole, they gain energy that way, and they kind of climb back out, they lose energy. But uh, dark energy, uh, acts to pry apart or uh, overcome the gravitational attraction in the cluster. And so the amount of energy that they uh, lose when they climb out is less than when they fell in. Uh, that allows us to measure the universe's 70% in dark energy. Same answer that we got over here. Another way we can tell is we look at the global geometry of space. There's a there's a relationship between the geometry you see in space and the amount of mass or energy in that space. This has been measured exquisitely with observations from the cosmic microwave background that tell us that uh, the total energy or mass in the universe is in our kind of funny units, one, whereas when we actually measure how much just mass there is, including the dark stuff, uh, that's only about 30%. So this extra piece, 70%, is obviously there. That's, as I said, independent uh, line of investigation that tells us this. We've seen the uh, action directly of dark energy. Uh, the largest clusters of galaxies are always pulling in new members, new, new galaxies, because they have a lot of attractive gravity. But on the larger scales, they have become less effective at doing that. We have seen the you know, arrested development of the largest cluster of galaxies that allows us to measure the amount of dark energy, again, about 70%. And something else I've been working on recently is, is to bookend the universe, to take the initial conditions of the universe as measured from the cosmic microwave background and use them to predict how fast the universe is expanding today. And by comparing those two, we again get that the universe is about 70% dark energy. So we have lots of independent evidence, but the way we really know that this is true is because we won the Nobel Prize in 2011. And they don't give you the Nobel Prize unless they're pretty sure. Um, but no, seriously, uh, we uh, uh, learned to our great excitement and amazement in 2011 that uh, the Accelerating Universe won, uh, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize. This is our team of uh, 18 members who all came with us. And uh, we had a great time in Sweden, you know, partying and dancing with the king and queen and all, all that good stuff that you hear. But there's kind of a dark side to this, which uh, was uh, displayed in this recent episode of the Big Bang Theory show. It's 2 a.m. What are you doing up? Nobel Prize acceptance ceremony streaming live from Stockholm. <laughs> Sure. I want to see what all the scientists are wearing this year. Look at these men. They've managed to win the top science prize in the world with no more understanding of the quantum underpinnings of the expansion of the early universe than God gave a goose. You should... They have good writers because that is exactly true. That we, we do not really understand the quantum underpinnings of this. We don't have a quantum theory of gravity yet to 
And uh, that's what's so fascinating about dark energy is it really cries out for it. I mean, it's something that uh, we can't really fully understand without that. Um, so if you're an optimist, you see the glass is half full. Wow, we've made tremendous progress in the last decade or so. We finally have the recipe of the universe. We know what it's made of. This is not something that we knew uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it's a surprising recipe, about 0.05% in planets, uh, about half a percent in stars, about 4% in gas, so less than 5% in all of these, these are the things that are built out of the materials in the periodic table of elements that you learn in chemistry class. This is what we call baryonic material or normal matter. The unfamiliar stuff, 25% in dark matter, and about 70% in dark energy. So we really have our work cut out for us because still about 95% of the universe is in a form that we don't really understand. Um, fortunately, uh, we keep getting new uh, instruments to work on to help us understand this. The, uh, in particular, the astronauts returned to the Hubble Space Telescope in 2009 uh, for the last time, unfortunately. They put a new camera in, uh, in particular a new wide field infrared camera, much more powerful than the old camera. Let me just show you what it means when you get a more powerful camera. Here's a distant picture of space with the old near infrared camera. This is an exposure taken 48 hours of keeping the shutter open, so it's very deep. Here's with the new camera in just 10 hours. So I'll hop back and forth, but pick out some very faint object and notice how much better you could see it, how much more light there is from it. And now bear in mind that's in one-fifth the exposure time. Oh, and also the field of view is a hundred times greater in the new camera. So if you want to uh, look for a supernova and you want to monitor lots of galaxies, this is really a great advantage. And so we've been using this over the last few years. We've found some of the most distant supernovae. Um, I'm going to tell you about a fun project I've been doing just in the last couple of years with this new camera. Um, I told you about parallax, just plain old geometry, parallax. This is very important uh, to measure distances with parallax because it forms what we call the first rung on a distance ladder, our ability to calibrate successive ever more luminous lighthouses further away. You want somebody to walk up to that first lighthouse with a measuring stick and actually figure out how far away that one is to know how luminous it is. Then if you see uh, that kind of lighthouse next to another lighthouse, you could calibrate the other one and, and so on. But that first step is very important, but very difficult. The reason is because uh, stars are very far away. These are our first lighthouses, are the stars. And uh, so you uh, wait six months for the Earth to move around the sun and you try to detect this tiny motion of uh, a star, your target, relative to even more distant stars. The problem is that stars are so far away, uh, we want to be able to measure their distances. We have to be able to detect uh, the motion of this star over six months, uh, that motion being as small as 1% of a single pixel on the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is an incredibly fine measurement that has to be made. So what an image actually looks like, I've shown here, is this kind of noisy thing where these spikes that you see are, that's the image of an individual star. And you are trying to figure out the location of the star here compared to its distant friend over here. You're trying to measure that separation, and then you take this picture again six months later, you remeasure that separation and try to tell that it is shifted by one one hundredth of a single pixel. That is tough. <clears throat> um, but a technique that uh, we came up with a few years ago to improve this was what if you spatially scan or drag the telescope along one direction while you're taking the observation? Instead of getting uh, two points here, you will get two parallel lines of light. Uh, and your ability to measure the separation between two lines is much greater than two points because there are many more pixels involved in the measurement. You could think of this as though you took a thousand sets of these images. Every set gave you a chance to measure this one one hundredth of a pixel. So with an image like this, we can actually measure down to one one thousandth of a pixel. So we can measure this parallax effect ten times farther or ten times more precise. Um, just if you're having trouble picturing what I'm talking about, uh, we literally drag the telescope across the sky, and so the stars turn into lines of charge, and then we are measuring the separations 
of those lines. And so um, this is working pretty well so far. This is my uh, first pilot program trying to do this. So what you see is a measurement every six months. That's what a dot is. And uh, what you see is for a number of different stars in the field, you see what looks like Ws. These Ws are, is this back and forth motion due to parallax. And after you see a few Ws, you're convinced that you're measuring this properly. The amplitude of the W, the size of that change, uh, the inverse of it is actually what the distance is. So for example, here is a star that I would say is, relatively speaking, very close to us. It's 250 parsecs away, uh, which, let's see, converted to Hollywood movie units, uh, that would be about a thousand light years. Um, I say Hollywood movie units because we don't really measure distances in light years. Nobody is there to start the light and then catch the light at the end. This is how we actually measure distances is by these deflections. Um, so uh, one parsec means a deflection of one arc second. So we are down here to measuring just milli arc seconds of deflection. Um, and so the inverse of this tells you that this is a very nearby star, relatively speaking. We measure that with good precision. Here's a very distant star. This is eight kiloparsecs away. This is actually the edge of the Milky Way galaxy that we can measure with this technique. And then here is a special kind of pulsating star called a Cepheid variable. These are used to build a distance ladder uh, to supernovae. And I could say more about that maybe in, in Q&A. Um, meanwhile, we're building new telescopes to go out and measure dark energy. Uh, we only get a small fraction of the time on the Hubble Space Telescope, maybe a couple percent a year of its time. Uh, think how much progress we'd be able to make with a dedicated Hubble Space Telescope. So the Europeans and uh, NASA are both planning to build these telescopes over the next decade. And the goal of these telescopes is to measure whether uh, the properties of dark energy are static, in which case the first option, that it's vacuum energy is most likely, that they are changing, in which case it's this dynamical energy like occurred in the early universe, or whether Einstein's theory of general relativity actually fits all of the data, whether it works on what I would say are small scales and large scales. Uh, do we need a new theory of gravity? Um, so I just want to end with reminding you, why is it that we're so excited about studying this dark energy? Well, first of all, it's most of the universe. So it's hard to say we really understand the universe when uh, the biggest part of it is still such a mystery to us. Um, it will determine the fate of the universe. Uh, we need to understand whether dark energy is changing or not. If it doesn't change, that's one prediction. But if it changes, it's still possible for the universe to recollapse. Uh, it depends on the way in which it changes. Um, but I think we're most excited about it because we have these two great understandings of physics, from quantum theory, uh, physics of small, to general relativity, physics of large. These two theories are not compatible, and generally we don't have to use them at the same time. So we, you know, as much as we can, we happily use one theory or the other in the right situation. Dark energy sort of lives at the nexus of these. We have to understand uh, how, uh, at the microscopic level, empty space, uh, uh, how it is defined, what is going on in it, and then we have to add that up over vast distances in the universe and describe how it gravitates, what gravity uh, it actually has. So uh, we feel like if we follow dark energy, it will give us a clue as to how to do physics at that interface. Um, until now, and actually, right, at the moment, it's quite embarrassing that our, our understanding of how to unite those is so off that, as I said, we get 120 orders of magnitude disagreement between what we see and what we imagine. Um, so uh, thank you very much for listening.